and, and still be able to make strong statements uh, and, 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 and raise, uh, raise critical issues? Well, I would say that such lawsuit is uh, bad news on a personal level, but good news on a political level, because it's, it raised awareness. I mean, if, uh, if uh, Noir Canada wouldn't have been uh, sued, or well, wouldn't have been the object of a lawsuit, uh, we would have sold maybe uh, uh, 200 or 300 copies. And that's it. I mean, it would be a book that nobody uh, knows. I, I, and, well, we had sort of a marketing uh, strategy of supporting the book. And it's, lawsuit is a way also to raise awareness about a, a problem. And I think that today corporations understand that it's a dangerous game to play. Uh, in Noir Canada, we already talk about Barrickle as being a corporation that is used to lawsuits. It's already a, criti a critic that we, we, I, I raised in the book. And it was uh, ironic to see that they sued us uh, for that book that was already describing their attitude, but since 2008, uh, according to what I know, didn't sue anybody. They stopped doing that on a mechanic basis. Uh, although they, they did it to, uh, we saw to Greg Palace, but to uh, also an East International, they sent legal letters and so on and so forth, so they were doing it a lot. So if Gold Corp were was suing a student for what it says about uh, about the corporation's involvement here and uh, its record, its uh, political or environmental track record. Well, it would be bad news for the student, but uh, it would be an issue, a political and a public issue. And well, it's not that bad, considering that there are ways to proceed so that uh, you know, anything so that we don't suffer too much from it. And the, the first thing is to uh, believe that we may have uh, collective support, support from the community, so that we feel it's not a, an individual matter, but a collective matter. Uh, there are also things that, uh, it's, there's no way to be sure one won't be sued, because corporations may use the legal system as a weapon against people that don't have access to justice because the legal system is made so that only uh, millionaires can have access to it. Um, so there's no, no way someone can be safe, but if we know we can have some legal advice, cheap legal advice, I mean uh, lawyers that are ready to work pro bono or at, at low cost, uh, and that we can raise some money to finance a defense, uh, it's not as bad as, uh, as it may uh, seem. And also there, are, it's, it's a pity, but the law, legal system is one of the last cultural institutions that is closely related to the bourgeois history. It's a bourgeois tradition that is uh, uh, kept with the legal system. And all the, bourgeois, the symbols of the bourgeoisie are, are, are seen as being sim symbol of credibility. The way you speak, the way you dress, the way you present yourself, uh, what you do for a living, it shows the, the credibility of someone. If you have a tie and you show properly and you work, I mean, in this, this, like in the, uh, this formal institution, you look more credible as if you're just in the street, I mean, doing something else. So it, it's, it's, it's silly to think that way, but it's the way it works. And it's the same thing for the sources one quotes in the document. If you quote sources from the UN, if you quote sources from the, uh, the business press, or sources coming from directly from the, the, business, the, the, the mining companies, you'll look more credible as if you quote uh, sources from activists, let's say. Even though activists may have a point of view on things that is far more interesting as the UN. I mean, we know as, as researchers that sometimes a sociologist that has an expertise in, uh, I mean, a political movement in uh, uh, South America will have a point of view on things that is much more documented and structured as a, a, a UN document. But the judge will consider that a UN document is something f strong, uh, although uh, in comparison with uh, the, the, the sociologist work. 
So the, 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 it's not an advice, but something we must know is that if in a production, a critic, we quote documents that seem credible to a court law, uh, then we, we are safer. Like if we quote the UN, if we quote an annual report, if we quote uh, a, a right-wing press, uh, it, it will look like more credible to a judge than if we quote uh, the, the work of activists. And also if we mention the point of view of the people we're talking about, the companies we're talking about, it will also look more credible. We may say, we don't know exactly, but we see that according to that document, that case, a case of abuse occurred, and the, the, the company denied it, but we would like to know exactly what happened. And then it's not an accusation, it's, it's a, a position saying, well, we want to know, and we have doubt. And in politics, we have right to um, say we won't, we, we, uh, we are against that kind of relationship with the university and Goldcard, for instance, because there is this question uh, open pending about what happened in that specific country and that specific period of time. And it can be raised as a question. I'm, for, I'm from the Faculty of Forestry, and um, Could you speak up, please? I'm from the Faculty of Forestry from this university, and we are researching about social issues uh, or related with anthropology or with political science, and we have all this evidence that comes from, for example, I'm working with indigenous communities, we are partnering with them in the Amazon, um, and we see all this evidence coming from their mouths and actually seeing what is happening in their communities. And like as a researcher, and I, I'm really interested in the, how, like what research means, but how come as a students we, I don't know, how, how can we be an objective? How can we uh, base on evidence that we are kind of hearing by ourselves um, to, I don't know, to being, um, to actually put that, to, to communicate that to the rest of the, for example, the science community or, or researchers or even politicians that actually is what is happening in those places without being, uh, I don't know, and, and I'm just talking, I'm, like, I'm not an activist. I don't see myself as an activist. I just see things, and I will like that uh, politicians or other researchers can notice what is happening in other, all, other places. But with these slabs, I feel myself like kind of, I don't know, I cannot transmit that what I'm seeing and what these people in the communities are telling me. Well, I don't see it as an advice. I just, I can only say that I, as far as I'm concerned, I take risk, and that's it. I mean, I know what I do is risky. It is, because we're in a, in a situation where it's easy, very easy for corporations to sue anybody for anything. Make it appear as being a question of law, although it's always political questions, and try to crush someone in the courtroom and using him as an example, or her as an example, for the others. But it, we can play that game also the other way around. When someone is sued, that person can also raise the issue on a social scale and say, I'm sued because I talked about that. I think it's a major problem. People should be aware of it. It's uh, the, person, the personal issues aren't uh, relevant in that specific uh, topic. It should be uh, raised as a social problem. And then we use the corporation that sued the, the, us as an example to the other corporations, saying if you do like this corporation, you'll be mentioned as being aggressive against people using courtrooms and the, system, the legal system. And I don't know today if Barrick Gold used us, or if we use them, to show 
the problem that occurred when a corporation sued people. I mean, everything was done with respect to the, this lawsuit to avoid everything that is in that documentary about Tanzania, about the Congo. This lawsuit was meant to make sure that nobody hear about it. And because they've done that, today in Vancouver, we're seeing a documentary talking about this issue. Who manipulated who? This is the question. Um, so if you could take yourself back before you wrote uh, Law Canada, you know, what were your expectations out of the book? Did you hope to be able to um, you know, change or kind of whistleblow on an industry um, to put light on top of, you know, obviously a lot of uh, human rights issues? And after going through everything, you know, do you consider your book an absolute success? I would say absolute. But I would say success. <laughs> um, well, at the beginning, uh, yeah, the, the, the idea was to raise awareness and also to uh, uh, provide evidence that there should be an inquiry commission here. It's the main pur purpose of the book. It's not saying they are all, are all guilty and everything is true. It's, just a, it's like pixel for a photography. I mean, all those cases are the pixel of a photography saying, well, look at the global picture. And what we see is a system. Very problem. It's not possible that all those allegations are all false. Uh, we, we, it would be the conspiracy theory to think that worldwide people are writing bad things about the mining industry of Canada to target the establishment here. I mean, it's silly. There are certainly a lot of things that are true and that are beyond the reality also. So I thought that we should raise awareness and I didn't think we would be sued because I told myself we're not mentioning on the title any company and if the company sue us, we, people will only talk about this particular company. And I was right, but I didn't know that I would have to prove it. Um, and well, it is a, a, a success because um, this book was written in a political perspective, not on a legal perspective. I don't care being sued. I don't care losing in front of court. I did lose. We settled out of court. And I don't care about that also. I don't care about the legal system with respect to that issue. Because it wasn't about legal aspects or legal institutions. It was about politics and the people. People being aware of what we do with their money and what we do with the country. It's supposed to be theirs. And on that specific level, we won. Because today, the theses that are in those two books, the theses that are in those two books, are, uh, are, are registered in the public consciousness, they exist in the public consciousness, and we debate about them nowadays, and it wasn't at all the case uh, 10 years ago. So we contributed, not, we, we're not alone, but we contributed to the existence of that debate. And as such, it is a victory. This is what we can hope from, an, I would say, a, an intellectual production. Uh, yeah, the behind and you after. Back. Yeah. I, uh, Fred Gove, I can't leave the room without saying how awestruck I am by your dedication, the amount of stress and sacrifice you've gone through, your personal courage to speak up, to defend freedom of speech. I was wondering if I could incite a nice, friendly, warm round of applause. <laughs> I always felt it was a collective movement. I wouldn't have done anything if I felt one second that I, I was alone in all this. I mean, I feel that it's, I mean, many voices that are uh, concentrated in, in that struggle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where is about 10 years ago, the World Bank, the other international finance institutions, and the UN agencies did not, uh, always did not allow the word corruption to figure in any of their reports. They've changed a bit, and they will now, uh, eat, they will even write books themselves about corruption in developing countries, and including in the mining sector. Um, but the evidence that they will cite is in their own internal files, which makes them inaccessible to anybody else. If we now turn to UBC, where faculty and to some extent students will be getting merit points for publication in peer-reviewed journals. We look then to see how editors of these journals 
look at these piles of circumstantial evidence of the kind which you are bringing forward. And we find that a court case like yours has a chilling effect on the editors. It absolutely terrifies them when you put in words like predatory mining or uh, what's the word for logging? Anyway, the similar thought for tropical forest logging. The editors run a mile when they see a paper, a draft of a paper, which mentions these things. They are terrified that there'll be another MacLibel case and they will be tied up for years and years and years. So, although the students here and even some of the faculty may come across the same sort of evidence in the course of their field work, sometimes directly, sometimes it's more usually, it's circumstantial, even though well triangulated. You can't mention it because the way the UBC has its merit system, it, discourage, it effectively discourages people from doing the research, and if they've done the research and accidentally fallen over this kind of information, we don't publish it. No. Well, what's interesting with this, I follow you totally, and I, I uh, acknowledge that being myself at the university. Uh, I have everything one needs to become a professor, but no institution never wanted me to be part of it. And uh, today I only have small contracts to teach in the university. And uh, even at this status of lecturer, sometimes it's very hard just to stay in the institution. This is a choice I've made. I don't want to participate to this system because when we participate in this system, uh, we only uh, structure our thinking, our thoughts, and our writing um, uh, in relation with uh, careerism, the career, but all, all also because we have nothing to say. I mean, we become boring. And the problem is people see that the university is becoming disconnected. Uh, I write essays on a very free manner. But I respect, I would say, epistemological traditions. I mean, I work with documents, and I, I'm, I'm cautious. I mean, I don't say anything I, mean, I want. I mean, I, I, I try to work in a, a serious way, but in a free way. And people see it. And people have no interest whatsoever in reading those scientific reviews. I mean, they are not read at all. And I find it funny and ironic to hear in the university people talking about publication, even though the publications are never public. I mean, it's never something that exists publicly. It's only a line in your resume, because you need to fool your resume of lines. But in the real life, I mean, it, people see that good books are written by people that left the university. And there are many of good, many good books that exist. Let me just follow up. Um, now we have the Mining Institute. It's not going to go away, mm -hmm. but it's in an early stage. Mm -hmm. It's clearly going to come across these kind of issues. It is committed to doing work on governance. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice are you going to give, or would you give, to the Mining Institute, given that it's um, what its action plan might be is still relatively unformed. Well, as I said in the previous discussion, my advice would be to disappear. Well, you can do that because yeah. the university needs the money. Yeah, well, that's just a fact. Yeah, well, it, it, this institute, uh, well, in, with respect to, I mean, critical criteria, this institute, it, as it is presented, is not relevant at all. The, the only thing that we can say, it's a neo-colonialist project that presents the southern countries as needing the help of Canadian taxpayers to uh, manage, as they say, local mining companies, although they aren't local mining companies, but subsidiaries from Canadian mining companies that aren't at all supervised and controlled here. And we do as if the problem was abo abroad, and we do as if the problems was a problem of poor country that cannot take care of themselves alone. And this whole project has to be um, um, criticized in a way that it becomes obvious that it is totally unrelevant to support it. 
uh, this the only thing I can see while well, well, analyzing it the, as carefully as I can. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about the publication of the, of the Canadian, uh, sorry, the English <laughs> translation, the second book of Talon books sit here in Vancouver? And you know, I think it's mentioned in the film that the, 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 the Talon books were uh, contacted by lawyers saying, watch it. They backed off, but they eventually did publish. Yeah, this um, is, do you want to talk a little bit about that process of how they came around to actually finally publish the book? And, yeah, we summarized Mark Canada in English in that book, Imperial Canada Inc. It's the same content, same footnotes, the same companies, the same names, the same, but it's summarized. While there's a difference between writing a book while discovering things and writing a book after having discovered things. And this is the only difference. When we wrote, when we discover, when, when one discovers things while writing, the book is thicker. Because we explain to ourselves what we're discovering while writing. And when we know a bit about it, we allow ourselves to summarize. But because we understand that we can say in a paragraph what we've said previously in three pages. And in the same content, the, the, the relevancy is the same. So that's why it's, it's, like, it's not that, that thick. Um, but it's the only difference. And in, in, in Imperial Canada Inc., uh, in conversion with Noir Canada, we wanted to uh, insist on the systematic aspect of things, and not only on cases, but why Canada is that haven of the mining industries. Well, uh, and so as we signed the documentary, we were working on it, and we had a lawsuit because they heard about the project and know how. Well, I know how because the uh, Talent Books put it on, the, on its website. And also they sued everybody that was mentioned, as I put it, even the Society that had nothing to do with it. And so people were afraid, they left the project, and, and so uh, Talon Books decided not to go along with the project, but afterward, uh, the, but the publisher changed his mind, and they consulted some lawyers and so that it was possible to, to work uh, as we planned. And I had to work on a different way because I lost some people on, on the project. But uh, anyhow, the, the, the book exists, and uh, it's the, the description on the way the jurisdiction here supports the industry on a financial manner, uh, level, on a political level, on a diplomatic level, uh, on a, the, the jurisdictional level, so that investors from Australia will create in Toronto a mining corporation that will exploit gold in South America, because they need this shell jurisdiction that is Canada to uh, operate uh, in favor of their interests. So, and so, uh, so thanks to uh, Kevin Williams of uh, Talent Books, it was possible to release that, that humble work of ours. It's uh, mentioned in the film by um, the journalist who might forget that. Uh, Greg Pallist? Sorry? Greg Pallist? Yes. Um, that has not kind of been published in the States, so they have no issue. Why do you continue to publish in Canada? Why don't you publish in the States? I, yeah, in English, in French, it wouldn't be uh, irrelevant because uh, we wouldn't have any audience. Ah. The problem is. If you publish, I, I thought about that at that time. If you publish a book in the U.S. and you want to distribute it in Canada, well, the distributor will face lawsuits. And this is what happened with Greg Palace. The best demo, I, I bought that book he shows, and I quote him. That's why Julien Fréchette mentioned it. Everything that Julien Fréchette mentioned in the film was in my book. And I mean, there, I, I find it's a pity that he didn't uh, underline it, but the, the, I mean, the, uh, all the, the, the persons that say, well, uh, that talk about the Sutton mining, uh, Tanzania, the Congo, well, he, he took that in, the, in the, my book and he went to see my sources. And the people you see think, by talking, they are my sources. And, well, what Palace explains is that the best money, democracy money can buy, I found uh, in uh, the, railroad, the New York Railroad Station. I mean, it's, it's so easy to find that it was in the I mean, mainstream uh, bookstores. Well, it's, it's not distributed in Canada because the distributor would face this lawsuits, uh, potential. And it's because of our uh, of the common law, uh, our legal system. In 
France? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I, I, I like the question. Uh, we had to withdraw more Canada, so we published it under a new title. It's Paradis Outaire in French and Imperial Canada Inc. in English. And Paradis Outaire was published in two versions. Uh, version in Quebec and then version in France. And the version in France also meant to be distributed in Africa, in, uh, in whole Europe. And it was interesting to have that book being published in France to make it international. Because Canada, what's happening in Canada is not only related to Canadian affairs, but uh, to, 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 to the whole world. Because it's like the Bahamas. What the Bahamas do in the banking sector doesn't only concern Bahamians, but the whole world, because it's banks being uh, everywhere that uh, open subsidiaries uh, in, in the Bahamas. But it's the same thing with Canada. So I went in Switzerland, I went in Belgium, I went in several regions of France doing speeches uh, two times, like tours, to explain to Europeans what are the, the, the threats with respect to the Canadian jurisdiction? And I had like, articles about the book in major newspapers like Libération or Le Monde Diplomatique. Uh, and it was in, for us a necessity to make it something international and not only Canadian. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I usually start my conferences in Europe saying that we have to uh, get rid of the uh, travel agency poetry about Canada <laughs> and that we should start to see the country as a threat with respect to mining issues uh, for the whole world. Because when the Canadian corporations uh, arrive somewhere, it has the support of a jurisdiction that uh, strongly cover whatever this corporation will do. And if they leave, you have no ways to uh, get reparation if damages were done. So this is a, and if, uh, effectively in Europe, uh, we still are this blue helmet country, pacifist, uh, the, 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 the model of democracy and all this. And it's, and it, people don't like us to criticize Canada because it's, for them, for Europeans, often Canada, Australia, and uh, Iceland are like the three last countries that are still uh, clean. <laughs> and if you take uh, out one of these, well, only two remain. There is a debate in Ontario to uh, vote for a law that would look alike the one occurred in Quebec with respect to our cause, uh, helping people that are sued uh, in an abusive manner to uh, have a defense. Or, but as we saw, the law is not working in Quebec because as soon as a corporation hires a, a, an, ar uh, an army of lawyers, send thousands of documents, no judge will say, oh, apparently it's abusive because there are too many documents. Uh, so it works only when there's a few documents or for small issues. Uh, in Ontario, uh, after a few months, maybe a year, a year after the end of the, the, the release of the movie, uh, we also set a lot of work uh, in Ontario too, in a very, I mean, at the beginning, the, we received some proposition of settlement and of public declaration saying uh, uh, we're ashamed to exist and we won't eat anymore and something <laughs> like that. It was the first draft. 
and we just let it go. When we were so bored about all this, we've done as if it didn't exist. And at a certain point, I think they get bored to see that we weren't playing their game, that we weren't playing any any way. So we had a very uh, simple settlements to do. Because Banro has still of interest in Congo. They are still very active. And their position is very controversial because they are there as, nowadays, as legitimate partners in Congo while they were active during the war. And this is an issue that should be raised. And I know that people have been working on that. And I think that they, they just they didn't want that book to be I mean, part of the, the equation when they started to operate. And I think that they were mainly there to support Barrett Gold at the beginning. that they are strong because we are afraid. Mm -hmm. I would say that they are strong because we are afraid. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I understand that it's risky, as I put it, to, to write whatever we think about them, but there are ways to do it so that they look silly if they sue someone. I mean, if you quote international reports and you mention their point of view and you say that you want to know uh, as a citizen or as a member of the uh, university community, you want to know more about it before accepting that this corporation uh, signed a partnership with the university and they sue you for that? I mean, uh, who's, who looks silly? I mean, who, I mean it, it, it's clear that it, it won't be uh, advantageous for the corporation to do that. And, uh, and it, it is the case if a lot of people speak out and not only uh, isolated people. And so this is on one hand, and uh, I mean, on the other hand, uh, hope is, uh, I, I, I kind of think that without expecting any uh, solution on the short term, we should do whatever we can so that we collectively at least achieve something without knowing exactly where we go. But if we try things, I mean, gathering like this, publications, uh, demonstrations, denunciations, uh, and we know that we're not alone at all in that struggle, and that more and more uh, people are getting involved in uh, that kind of uh, activity, activism, thinking, well, we'll arrive somewhere without knowing exactly where and when and how. And, and sooner or later, there will be a huge crisis related to oil, the oil industry, related to our capitalist and consumerist regime, which is a failure. It's an anthropological failure. We know it. It's obvious. I mean, it won't last long. So it, it's interesting to talk about it as a failure right away, so that when this huge crisis will occur, people will already be aware of the problems and also will have, will have think uh, at uh, alternatives. And this is our I would say, historical responsibility. And it's an interesting per period of time for that, even though it's not always easy. Thank you, that Alan, that, that, that picture of, of sort of continued resistance is really important. 
Um, just to, I brought up earlier that uh, a group of students mainly and just a couple faculty members organizing at SFU around the Gold Corp donation back in 2010 received a letter from Gold Corp's lawyers threatening a libel suit, uh, demanding that a website be taken down, that a retraction be published, etc. cetera. Um, and so we met uh, this group of people. And we, we contacted our administration right away to say, what's the administration going to do? Your students and faculty are being threatened with a lawsuit. We received no response from the administration over that question. They didn't want to, like maybe didn't want anything in print on record saying anything about that. Uh, but they were completely mute. And we met as a group, and the students were terrified. And this is exactly the, the effect of these suits. Even just the threat, not, not even receiving the suit, but just the threat of the suit is terrifying. Every student felt like, there's no way I can go through something like that. How could I possibly? Uh, you know, but it's funny too. The, the website went down, but we, we published no retraction, and we kept many people wound up working with Mind Justice Alliance here in Vancouver and, and uh, continued to, to work on that issue. Um, so there was no follow up from the lawyers either, or the university for that matter. So it feels kind of ambiguous, it's a bit of a, a defeat in a way, uh, and yet those kind of persistent, low level struggle small as we are, continues to stumble along. And I would add that I think being in a lawsuit as the one as I experimented can also be exciting. I mean, really, I mean, I had good moments during those four years. It was not only about suffering. I mean, I met fascinating people. And if I'm here today, it's because of these lawsuits. I mean, I, I made friends. I mean, I, 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 I met, I would say that I met the best person of this country during these, I mean, this struggle. I mean, so many good people that came to me, helped me, supported me, and we were all together in that great journey. I mean, that great adventure it was very. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, some some aspects were terrible, of course, uh, but some were very exciting and. It, I mean, I would be proud if people here were sued from Gold Corp because they stand up, they stood up. They stand up and they say, well, even though you'll use a courtroom to crush us, we don't care because the issue is too important. And this is the only reason why I, I struggle, because the issue was too important. I mean, the, the millions of people died in Africa and I would care about my, my bike and my books and I mean, no, I mean, we, uh, we don't care about this legal system. It was created by this elite and for this elite. And we know uh, how it works and why it works that way. And we're stronger than that. UBC has a formal policy which states that the university is in support of independence in research. It's quite explicit, it's very short, and it's very explicit. So people should be able to rely upon that. So, um, until the next uh, uh, retaking the university uh, talk, that will feature Dr. Stephen Collis uh, over in Forestry. In, in what room is it? It's Cop 2916. Cop 2916. It's in a, 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 a kind of a back annex on the east end, I believe, of the Forestry building. It's really difficult to get to. Um, but COP, C-A-W-P, 2916. Um, um, I'll be attending that, I believe. We'll be attending that one as well. We need to make time so that people can, can get across campus, down to the south end of campus uh, in Forest Street before that. But um, this has been a, an inspiring and productive conversation. Dr. Deno, thank you very much. Let's